Um, Alaikum, peace everybody. Welcome to the City Circle event on embracing diversity in sport. My name is Rimla Akhtar and I'll be your chair for this evening. For those of you who haven't been, <coughs> <laughs> haven't been to a City Circle event previously, yeah, sure. <laughs> the way things work um, is that each of our panellists will have up to 20 minutes to, to speak um, on the topic and they'll share their experiences and then we'll open it up to the floor for, for any questions and comments. And then after that you have about half an hour some sort of informal networking um, to, to meet with everyone and also an opportunity obviously to, to speak to the panellists on a one-to-one basis if you want to do that. Um, so tonight's event, it comes at a time when the spotlight is firmly on diversity in sport. As those of you who have worked in this field will know, there's been a lot of talk about the issues. Um, of equality, of opportunity, um, but very few within the industry feel that much has actually been done practically to, to address the issues and overcome them. The narrative has often been that the minority communities simply don't want to engage. Um, and now we find that those communities are standing up and speaking out against such themes. So we know, for example, that despite black footballers making up approximately 30% of um, players in our, in our league clubs, we can count on one hand the number of professional black coaches that there are within those clubs. We also know that despite the continuing talk of the need to address the lack of diversity in boardrooms and decision making positions, we've seen a decline in the number of ethnic minorities in those positions. We know that despite the number of talented Asians and other non-black ethnic minority communities that play sports such as cricket and football, we simply don't see that talent represented in the professional structure, either as players or coaches, or indeed any other positions within the sports. So tonight we have with us a distinguished panel of speakers, each with their own very unique perspective and experiences in the sports industry. Each one of them has played their sport to the highest level, and they've given also given a huge amount back to the community as well. And I'll introduce each of them before, we speak, before they speak, um, to give you a bit of background about them. Um, and we'll hear from them on their experiences and their thoughts on the issues at hand. Um, just to say also, we are sort of live tweeting, I think, um, on, on this um, topic. So those that weren't able to make it tonight because of Good Friday and, and venue change, um, you know, they, they will also follow it, follow it on Twitter. And also, we're, we're recording, as you can see, and that will be made available to, um, to people that weren't able to make it tonight. Um, in terms of Twitter, it's at the City Circle. Um, we've, we've thought up a quickly just now a, a hashtag sports diversity if you want to put that down as well um, and my sort of we've got Roxana it's at Roxana Begum at Ikram, Ikram official Ikram official and mine is at Rimla Akhtar um, so let's go straight to our panelists first of all we have the exceptionally accomplished footballer Paul Elliott Paul is a former English footballer who's played as a central defender He's played for Charlton Athletic, for Luton Town, for Aston Villa, the Italian club Pisa, Celtic, and then Chelsea, following an impressive season in Scotland where he was awarded Scottish Player of the Year. Paul made history by becoming the first ever black captain of Chelsea FC. Yes, that's Chelsea FC. In 2003, <laughs> Paul was given an MBE for his services to football and a CBE in 2012 for services to equality and diversity in football. He was a founding member of the anti-discrimination campaign Kick It Out, and he served the organisation for over 25 years. He's currently a leading consultant in inclusion and diversity within football. He's a member of the FA's Inclusion Advisory Board, and he's recently been elected um, a member of the FA Council, and I'm proud to say he's a wonderful colleague and friend. So over to you, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Do I need, do I need this? Would you prefer me with or without? Does it matter? Do, do, for recording purposes, does it make any difference, is it? No? Thank you very much, <coughs> I always say, as I say to my children, flattery gets them everywhere. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm sure that's applicable today. Good evening to you, and uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for attending. Um, as well, my background, uh, my mother and father, first generation uh, Jamaican immigrants that came to the UK in the, uh, in the late 50s. And I've always basically come from a sporting family. My mum was a very, very good athlete. My father played a lot of cricket. Uh, my brothers um, and my sisters all had a, a very good sporting gene. So um, I think that was the, uh, the golden thread uh, throughout the whole family. But obviously, um, as one can appreciate, you know, the 60s 
was a very challenging time for, for that first generation of, of, of black people, uh, Jamaican immigrants. And there were some very challenging moments. And, um, you know, I soon realized, certainly from my uh, experiences, my mum always said to me, you have to work twice as hard just to get an opportunity and be equal. And um, we all, she always instilled work, work ethic and uh, education, which was always going to be the hopeful long-term key to uh, success. Um, my early experiences actually of, of racism was, was quite interesting because I mean I went to a fabulous school, two very good schools and had many friends. But when I, I suppose, playing for the system, my very first club was Charlton Athletic. And I never actually realised at the time, but um, when, when I was scouted there at sort of nine, ten years of age, they actually played me as a winger because I was very fast and a good athlete. But I actually didn't enjoy playing as a winger. Um, and I actually believe even then I could be a centre-half. And I remember keep saying to the club, why, why can't I play centre-half? Because um, I looked at my understanding, you know, it's a very important position, a position of responsibility. Um, strong leadership, you're in the, you know, you're the, you're the field commander, you know, in the middle of the field. And I've always had plenty to say to myself and believed that I had potential leadership qualities. And I couldn't always understand that I was playing in all different positions other than the position that I really wanted to play in. And um, there's a particular uh, gentleman uh, called Roy Passy. He was a lovely man, and, and, and he came to Charlton then. And, and, and I said to him, Roy, why, why am I playing in, the, in this position? And uh, he said to me, Paul, they, they don't think you're good enough. So I'm saying, well, they don't, I, I've not had a chance to demonstrate in that position whether I'm, I'm good enough or not. And, uh, and he says, well, Paul, you're going to get a chance, and I'm going to give you the chance. And I remember in a particular game I played, um, the centre-back there, he, he wasn't having a particularly good game, and, and, and Roy says, Paul, go and play centre-back. And, and, and I absolutely loved the responsibility. And I think thereafter, you know, that was a real sort of shift in, in mindsets because I never realised that that was a kind of, could it be deemed as a kind of covert form of racism? I wasn't sure. But once I actually played in that position and started to impact and influence, then all of a sudden, the other coaches that said you weren't good enough saying, well, actually, Paul, you're, you're, you're a damn, you, can, you can play there. And I says, well, I always believed I could. All I ever wanted was a, an equal opportunity to demonstrate what I can and can't do. Um, and I think thereafter, as I said, I was only a young man, and I think that was a sort of significant shift because, you know, by the time I was 16 years of age, you know, I'd made my debut in, in Charlton's first team, and that's very young. Uh, whilst I was still at school. But uh, I do remember uh, what was interesting um, when I made my debut was, and this was the, the, the more subtle uh, areas, that we were having breakfast. And one of the players said, um, uh, should we get some coon flakes for Paul? And I'm thinking, sorry, did I, did I hear something not quite right there? And I asked this player to say, this, say that again. And he looked at me and started laughing. And he repeated it. And I have to be honest with you, that's my first real confrontation, shall we say, with racism from another player. And it was my own player. <laughs> and, and, and at that juncture, my understanding was, it's always going to be predominantly the opposition. And I have to say that um, it was a very ugly scene. Uh, but you know what? I, I think. That was a significant shift for me because number one, I stood up for myself. Number two, um, I was only a young boy at 16 and you're not really, you're still, you know, you're still a baby in, in, in age terms. And I was, if I'm honest with you, thinking about at that time, because I remember exactly how I was feeling, I, I felt a little bit emotional um, because I'm thinking, this is somebody that I've trained with, worked with. I was 16 years of age, sort of playing a boy in a man's world, and I had to grow up very, very quickly. Um, and I think that that really shaped me for my different experiences to come. Because at that time, uh, certainly in, 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 in the late 70s, early 80s, not only was it a challenging uh, sort of time for, for black people, for community, but also for black footballers. And I was that generation of young black player that was trying to make his way in professional sport. 
and it was very difficult um, because I remember at 16 actually playing at Chelsea and you know I understood about you know you had like combat 18 you had these shaving heads wearing you know steel cap boots and and it was a very very intimidating atmosphere and I've never I have to be honest with you and it's it's ironic my story as I go into this where, where I came with Chelsea in the end, but to actually witness that at Chelsea and been playing, and, and I remember going to places like Leeds and Burnley, um, Newcastle, and, and they were even more very, very serious difficulties because obviously that part, you know, I was really used and familiarised with, with South East London and living in this sort of very nice cosy atmosphere around Woolwich and Charlton and, you know, Lewis from where I was born and lived around Thamesmead, Plumstead, Everywood. Not quite Belsey's Park and Hampstead, but I'm proud of my roots. <laughs> and I'm very proud of them and I go back there often. So, so for me, you know, seeing that real significant uh, issue and, being, and that experience really shaped me for what was to come in my career. And it was considerable. And when I left Charlton and went on to Luton, I mean, it was, it was a breath of fresh air in many respects because we had a Jewish manager. His name was David Pleat. He's a dear friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I remember this particular game where we had sort of seven black players playing against Southampton and it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, we got beat and, 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 who, did, and, and who got the blame? <laughs> it was the majority of us. But um, I think that's when I felt safer because there was that visibility in numbers and, and I felt part of something. But also the leadership from the manager was so significant because being a, 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 a Jewish person, he has had his own challenges. And it's funny that it took the conversations we've had within the last five years was more than we had in the previous 20 on the issue. And it, and it was amazing the challenges that, 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 that he spoke about, uh, David, and, and, and his resolve and his resilience, I think, is, is really commendable. And he's at a position that he wants to give something back. But I think that move, moving my career on, I went to Italy uh, and up here, uh, after Aston Villa. And, and that's when I sort of realised about <laughs> well, you've got the north and you've got the south. The north is very affluent, very prosperous. <coughs> the south, there are big, great social economic issues there. And the north called the South Africans. And I, and I couldn't believe that environment because Italy is such a beautiful country. Uh, you know, you know I, I always sort of say a line that uh, I went there and I discovered um, women and Pinot Grigio. But uh, that was before I went. But it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And I was so honoured to go to that country uh, because I was only 22 years of age. And I became the first, or certainly the youngest, uh, not only the youngest, but the first black defender to go out and play in Italy. And I was so honoured, but the environment there, whilst it was a beautiful country, some of the, the hostility there, the tension there was really, uh, really impacted on me. Um, because the only best thing about it, I couldn't understand what they're saying. <laughs> but you can certainly tell by, you know, when you had the possession of the ball, somewhere like in England, the monkey chanting, the booing, you know. Um, Okay, there wasn't the throwing of bananas, that came later. <clears throat> but, you know, that for me realised my purpose in life. And I think that experience shaped me for the, for the experience thereafter, which was going on to Scotland. And I thought, you know, what I left behind was challenging. But obviously going to Celtic, which was a, a fabulous move for me professionally, obviously inherited a kind of, you know, Catholic, Protestant, the whole, uh, you know, bigotry uh, around religion. And... and in many respects, that was just like a, a way of life there. And I couldn't, you know, if I looked in a room, I couldn't know whether someone was Catholic or Protestant. I'd just see them as, as they are. But obviously by the, by the name and obviously the background of the family and, and the historical connections, um, it really, it was a fabulous move for me in professional terms. And, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, why am I having all these experiences? You know, there has to be some good, you know, that's coming from this adversity. And I realised that... The, the good that was coming out it was, of that was that, you know, I had to take some kind of leadership. I had to stand up. I had to stand up for myself. I had to stand up for my community. And I have to say, hey, you know, what is it that, that, that I want that many people could enjoy? And then it comes down to about human rights. It comes down to the fundamental human right to work in a racist-free environment like anybody would, like you would in, in your office or, or in your place, place of work. And you would not consent to being 
abused that. You wouldn't consent to being racially abused. You, would, you wouldn't consent to that in your office. So why should I, as a professional footballer then, at that juncture, consent to that? So that's when I had to stand up and say, hey, this is not acceptable. Scotland here, it's a wonderful country. You, I love the honour. I love the integrity. I love the humility. I love the sincerity about the people in Scotland. But that was an issue that I think then, you know, and it's still obviously still on game, but through the power of sp football, it's been managed better. And that's obviously the social power of, of, of football, what it does. And I think that was the shift. And I come across a, a gentleman, a chap called Tony Higgins, who's a, who's a, who's a wonderful man. Um, and I've, I've worked now with Tony for the best part of 20 years. And, and I stood along Tony. He put up his head above the parapet and says, hey, we've welcomed Paul you know, into our country. Paul has made a positive contribution on the pitch. You know, hey, he, he has that fundamental right to work in, 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 a, in, in a proper environment. And you've got to show respect. And I think that was a real shift because I was thinking, well, in England, it was like fixture and fitting of the modern day game. And it was very hard to come out because I was an absolute minority. You know, my remit, you know, to nullify my opponent and impact on the game, you know, that, that was my, that was my, my job description. And, and the only way I felt at that juncture I could make a, a positive contribution was by example. Leading an example for my leadership on the pitch by me influencing the game and, and obviously uh, doing the best of my, to, to my ability. And hopefully that will encourage other people at that time to come into football. And I think that, you know, there was some real big challenges there. And that was the first real sort of time when I sort of said enough was enough. And I had to use the success that I had at that point, you know, being successful in England, being very successful in Italy, you know, coming to Scotland also as a first back player to play for Celtic and, 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 and influencing the club forward. And then, you know, having been, you know, won some very good awards by the journalists, and I realised that was the time to go. I left my stamp there as a player, but more importantly, left it as a person, as a human being, and as a human being that says, this is unacceptable. You have to do something about it. You have to change. Because at that juncture, there wasn't any real legislation, there wasn't a legislative framework in place regarding the, the, the Football Offences Act of 1991, updated in 19. That wasn't in the game at the time. And if it was, it certainly wasn't being implemented. So I got a fabulous move to, to Chelsea. And, and, and that was the irony about that move because I was thinking, you know, what have I let myself in for? thinking about my experiences I had as a, as a young 16-year-old. But then the, the whole dynamics of football changed at that point, coming back to England insofar as the diversity in stadiums, the, you know, that was in sort of the early 90s, you know, there was more, there was far more disabled, more women. It was the, the whole environment, it felt a lot safer, far more inclusive, far more diverse. And, and I thought, well, yeah, this, this, this is a change, this is significant. And I think, you know, I work for a, an interesting chairman, a chap called Ken Bates. Now, those that know Ken, you either love him or it's like Marmite. You love him or you hate him. And I fortunately loved him because he said to me, Paul, I want to make change at this football club. It's had a historical reputation. And, 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 and at times, I think Ken realised that, you know, some of the things he'd said or he'd done was contributory in that. Uh, but he says, we have to change. And he says, one of the first changes is going to be that you're going to become our first black captain. And I was very honoured because Chelsea's a huge club and I was thinking about the ugliness and I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to go down too well. But ultimately it's about what I've done as a footballer. That's the point. What I've done as a footballer, because I'm there, that was about meritocracy. It's about me saying, I've done well, but I want you, Paul, to lead the club going forward. And, you know, Glenn Hoddle came to the club shortly thereafter and I worked very closely with Glenn and, and I think that was a real turning point for football, for society, um, and then um, I got a, 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 a bad injury, came out of the game. And, and then that's when I started to say, well, Paul, what do I do now? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do? Um, that's when um, Kick It Out was really launched. Because I realized that, you know, after working as a coach, I really wanted to do something far more meaningful. And I'd been rejected. I wanted to become a manager and go on. But that's when I started to understand the structural issues, the issues around institutional discrimination. Uh, because, I'd, because I really wanted to really move in that area with real vigour, but I could see all the issues and all the barriers. And all I ever wanted, as, as people wanted today, was equality of opportunity. 
sort of transparency, accountability in processes, and understanding why um, things had to change, <coughs> football had to change, attitude had to change. You know, there had to be more equality, there had to be more inclusion. And then there was a kind of cohort of players and the movement was growing. And, 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 and my future was very much in that place for the last sort of 20 odd years. And I've seen so much change, but there are big challenges, there's big issues. And, we, and I know from my work um, with the FA, we're doing some really good work, but I have to say there are some big challenges ahead. Because when I was interviewed for the position, I, as I, I, I said, they said to me, Paul, what was your, what's your wish list? I said, what I want to see is inclusion, diversity, equality, within the DNA of the FA of its 750 staff, the boards, the councils, the committees. That has to be within the FA's DNA because they are the leaders, they are the governing body. And I generally feel there's an appetite for real change within the FA. The leadership is very important. I think the leadership is there. But there's still a lot of structural <coughs> issues there. It's a very, very challenging and demanding place. Um, but I, I, I generally feel that, you know, how do we evidence this? Because you have to say there's close to 30% of players in the game who are black, but less than a handful of coaches. Why? Less than a handful in administration. Why? I think there's an appetite to be involved by many uh, 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 people from the black and minority ethnic communities. There is a genuine appetite. They have to be reached out to. They have to be welcomed. But equally as well, I've learned as well, they have to be qualified to. Don't give, like, as you would in any job, there would be no excuse to say you're not qualified. But all I've ever wanted, as they've ever wanted, was I believe in meritocracy. But you can't get meritocracy until you get transparency and accountability and equality of opportunity. Because that's all you speak to any person, any male, any female, from, from, any, uh, from any minority background. That's all they've ever, ever wanted. And I'm very much the same. And I think that's really one of the big challenges. Because I understand the social, the social, human, and economic benefits of diversity. It's huge. There's a massive talent pool out there within the black and minority ethnic community that want to be involved, that want to be welcomed. And I think this is the challenge now to, for clubs, and, we, and there's been lots of discussions about this Rooney Rule. You know, um, and I'm a believer in positive affirmative action. And I think the Rooney Rule you, you know, should really be from the championship level coming down. And there is a pipeline. I mean, the PFA are, are doing some of the work. I mean, for all, if you look at all the, in terms of diversity within the structure of the game, the PFA are going to be the most diverse. But they've got excellent leadership in Gordon Taylor that believes in inclusion, believes in equality, believes in diversity. And that's reflected in the composition of his, uh, his staff. So there is, so, but that more has to be done. And I have to say the FA are doing some, some good work, but we have to keep pushing. And I am really at the heart of some work with some, with some FA councillors, and it's very, very challenging. But I think we're getting, you know, we're changing minds, we're changing attitudes, we're changing perceptions, notwithstanding the obvious uh, challenges. And I think if you look at the, you know, you know I, was, I, was, I mean, I found out, my daughter told me a stat today. She said to me, Dad, did you know within the, there's 33 boroughs in, in, in London? I says, yes. Did you know each and every one of them has got over a hundred different languages? Mm -hmm. I said, no, I didn't know that. So that's telling you, you know, the challenges that needs to be done. So, all I'll just say, thank you for lending me your ears. I hope you've derived some benefit from my journey. I probably could have gone on for another 15 or 20 minutes, <laughs> but I'm not because I've had the yellow card <laughs> and the red card's going to be forthcoming. <laughs> so, thank you for lending me your ears and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's wonderful to hear to hear about your journey. But we're going to move on to, uh, I would say, the inspirational Roxana Begum. Um, I got to meet Roxana when she was shortlisted for the Muslim Women's Sport Foundation Ambassador Awards in 2012 um, for the UK Sportswoman of the Year. She's the current British and <coughs> European kickboxing and Muay Thai wow. champion. So don't mess with her. Um, and that's in addition to being um, a world championship double bronze medalist and the current number one still title contender. Yeah, she just recently had a fight, didn't you? Which didn't go as well as we'd hoped. But um, I'm sure there'll be there'll be um, you know even even more.
more great fights for you coming up. Um, but after attaining her BA in architectural technology and working in the field for a year, Roxana soon realised her passion lay in sports. She took up kickboxing at the age of 18, and then she trained secretly while she was at university <laughs> because she was afraid to tell her family because they might have not approved of her choice. Um, in 2009, she was selected for the GB team, and this was followed by a bronze medal in the World Championships in 2009. She became the British Atom Weight Champion in 2010. She won a gold medal at the European Championships in 2011. Um, and she's had two world title fights, one in 2013, and as I say, just one very recently. So Roxana also, if, if that wasn't enough, works as a science technician. Um, and she also undertakes group and personal training through her Fight Your Corner initiatives in the heart of East London. So over to you, Roxana. Hi, okay, so... Um... <coughs> You covered most of it. <laughs> um, so I come from a Bangladeshi Muslim background, born and bred in London, and um, I don't have the sporting genes. As you know, Bangladesh is probably one of the most unlikely countries to compete in any sport. Um, I can't actually think of how many sports they compete in, even in the Olympics. They were they didn't really have a massive team. I think they had like five athletes taking part. Um, and I mean, ever since I could read, I was always fascinated by sports, and in particular martial arts. Uh, growing up watching Bruce Lee and uh, Muhammad Ali, I was just so inspired and felt that this is what I want to do. Um, but I was also aware of the fact that I was a female, a Muslim female, a Bangladeshi female, and a very small build. Um, so. I had the challenge of how do I tell my parents that I wanted to compete and do, do a sport like this. Um, so I was afraid of telling them and um, have basically gaining the support. Um, not only that, the opportunities were very difficult at the time. Things have changed and have come a long way now, but in those times it was very difficult to find a gym, find a female instructor, being a Muslim female. I, you know, I wanted to feel comfortable in my environment and where I train. Um, so I kept it to close to my heart. I just thought once I, you know, start working, maybe I would go and look into supporting myself and getting into sports and martial arts. So I came across a kickboxing class at the age of eight, 16 actually. Um, and it was, it was an after school club that was run. Uh, went along to it, just one session, and I fell in love with the sport. And I think I realised I had a natural, um, natural kind of skill to it. Um, but later realised when I went to go to the second session, the funding was gone. So I couldn't compete. I was just like, oh God, well, what can I do now? Um, which, is, which is when I actually came across my coach and I went to the Jim Co. gym. And... Um, I think Bill just looked at me and thought, what is she doing in here? <laughs> you know, he's got these big heavyweight guys who are serious about training, and there's me wearing my little hijab. In those days, I was still quite young. I was quite young and timid and shy, and my parents, you know, dressed how my parents wanted me to dress. So <laughs> when in there, he sat there, and he thought, what am I doing in there? So I explained I want to learn martial arts. <laughs> Um, and he would tell you this himself, you know, he thought I was the most unlikely person to walk through the gym. And, um, you know, the first thing he said, you know, I think, was he noticed I had a great passion for the sport and he, he really respected me for that. Um, but I, I actually didn't see myself, um, you know, as a Muslim female, as a I just went in there and I thought I loved the sport and that's I want to be included and that's that, that was my mental attitude. Um, obviously later on I had my own inner conflict where I thought am I doing something wrong, am I going against my religion, am I going against um, my parents um, and the values um, that we uphold. Um, so I had a lot of inner conflict and debate with myself growing up um, through my time in university, hence I kept it a secret, I wasn't sure how to come out and tell my parents and whether I'd receive the blessing and I wasn't ready to give up my sport. That was my happy place, that was where I, I felt safe and I happy, I just needed a bag and I just needed to get on with my training. 
um, I wasn't there to you know make friends or get into a social kind of um, environment I was just so happy that I could you know pursue my passion and he actually did shape me as a person he gave me something to look forward to he broke down so many barriers for myself um, and I didn't even realize this that I was doing this um, so later on after I finished university this is when I realized and my coach would he would always approach me and said you, you live a lie <laughs> and you know you're living a double life and I, I mean I did agree with him but I just didn't you know how to approach my parents and you know bring it to their attention um, I, I knew my father had noticed that um, he, he said to me one day, you walk like a boxer. And I thought, <laughs> 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 I did boxers walk. I <laughs> but I went to my room, hid my trophies, and made sure he didn't see any of that. Um, but what I did do, once I finished university, I felt, I came to the conclusion that I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't going against my religion. I was just, you know, I was taking up a sport which is actually recommended in our religion. And it's a, it's a way of lifestyle. It should be a part of our lifestyle. Um, and there wasn't very females in the gym. It was, you know, looking back now, I'm thinking, whoa, how did I do this? Because it is a very intimidating walking into a gym full of men you know full of testosterone and um, it can be quite daunting and being a female I just I look back and I think wow I just did it but um, it can be very difficult even now for females to walk into a gym and these facilities need to be available for women in general not just female uh, Muslim women but we need to have this um, facilities to enable and help them access sport despite the religion, despite their colour, despite you know their background and disabilities and um, you know issues that shouldn't be an issue. Um, I mean I recently fought for the world title and I felt that I was strong enough to win that fight. I felt in my heart that I won that fight. It was actually a very close fight, but I felt strongly enough that I won two rounds and she took one. My coach would agree with me, the whole audience would agree with me. But unfortunately, that, that thought does come into your head where you think, could they be racist? Could they be? I mean, that's something that I can't prove. Or, But it's very true what Paul was saying, that I, I feel that sometimes that I have to work twice as hard, in fact 10 times as hard because I've also got a medical condition which is their me that I battle with all, you know, all, all the time and what I have to do is prioritise and um, I've realised that I've come to a point, I, I never intended to have this journey, I, I saw myself as a young female who's just pursuing my passion and I just fell in love with the sport but I've realised that become a role model to these young females and people in general because I'm going against all odds um, and breaking down these barriers. Hence, I, I feel that I'm in a platform where I can make a difference and I would like to take that on board and be that difference and hopefully inspire others to do so. Um, hence, you know, I'm carrying on with what I'm doing and I want to be part of these events and circles where we can reach out to young people and tell them that it is possible because I'm here, why can't they achieve their dreams and passion? Um, it, it does take hard work and dedication, but that's not impossible. Thank you. Thank you. I thought she was inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not by no means least, we have the groundbreaking Ikram Butt. Ikram uh, made sporting history by becoming the first Asian rugby player to represent England. Amongst others, he's played for Leeds, uh, Leeds Rhinos um, and Leeds uh, London Broncos even, um, enjoying an illustrious club career. He also captained the Pakistan Rugby Union team to their first ever victory. Today, Ikram is widely recognised as a champion of community integration, seeking to challenge social and cultural barriers through the medium of sport. He serves as a mentor and role, role model to young people aspiring to play sports at all levels. And as a vehicle to achieve this, he founded the, the British Asian Rugby um, Association, BARA, which we'll hear about, I think, and more recently, Sporting Change, 
which has since played a pivotal role in various community-focused campaigns and initiatives. Uh, I'm okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, welcome. Salaam Pleasure to be here and delighted to be able to attend. Uh, sit alongside a rock star lineup, as one tweet this morning <laughs> described as uh, Roxana, Ribbler, Paul. Silly an honour and privilege for me to do so. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey and then we've got a short video clip with some slides to go with. Um, my love affair with sport began as early as I can remember at a tender age of five years old. 30 years on? Okay, 40 years <laughs> on. <laughs> the love, passion and desire that <coughs> inside me is stronger now than it's ever, ever been before. And that's quite a statement uh, coming from myself given the fact that throughout my journey uh, from grassroots, a professional playing career spanning over 13 years, uh, and within my current roles today, it's been quite a roller coaster of challenges and obstacles that I've had to overcome. Despite pockets of good working practice, there's still a mountain to climb in embracing sports and making it fully inclusive at all levels. We must reach out and engage with the wider communities. Better understanding of each other creates respect. Better understanding of each other and respect creates trust and confidence and breaks down barriers. I speak at a time when communities all over the world face many challenges, whether they are political, social, cultural or economical challenges, there has never been a more important time to use a powerful vehicle of sport as a means of bringing people together in an environment of mutual understanding and respect. In the middle of a recession, it's always a danger that racial and cultural tensions are highlighted because of the tough economic times. So this agenda is important now more than ever. Having said the sport in both kids, cause of rugby, league and union, and remaining the only British Asian to have represented England, I'm fortunate to have witnessed firsthand the barriers that this vehicle can overcome, bringing positive change and a meaningful difference to those who embrace it. Now more than ever, we need to inspire our young people the shared values of wisdom, moderation and inclusivity. Don't want to get the impression that it's all been plain sailing. I and many friends have had to struggle to get to where we are. We have been subject to racial abuse from time to time and then to shrug it off. But we do not see why it should be harder for Asians to succeed in playing rugby. We also thought that it is in everyone's interest that league and union should play together and that faith and race should not be a barrier either. Every person's life is unique. All my life I have sought to do one thing, work with everyone regardless of race, gender, colour, creed and religion so that I can play my part in making sports more accessible, inclusive and enjoyable. Whether it be in schools, clubs, local communities or with fine-tuned athletes, I firmly believe that sport has the power to make a positive difference to people's lives. When I first started playing rugby, it was a sport which was almost exclusively white. Asian communities were hardly seen on the terraces, let alone on the field. Inspired by the desire to break the popular myth that Asians can't play rugby, I became determined early in my career to overcome stereotypes which predetermined that I was destined to fail. Excuse me, gone a bit too far. <laughs> Overcoming religious and cultural barriers on one side and a degree of racial prejudice and discrimination on the other I managed to bring about a small miracle when I signed for Fredston Rovers. Let me explain. Back then, Fredston had a great tradition of rugby, was known to be a small working class manning town with a population of 12,000 people, predominantly white, with only a handful of people from black and ethnic minority communities living there. <coughs> Through hard work and dedication on and off the field, I was immediately embraced by the club and thus I started on this journey to break down barriers and build bridges between our divided communities. These achievements have helped me to develop myself further in rugby and as an individual. Soon enough, 
with much positive media coverage of my involvement in sports, I was often mentioned as a role model for British Asians. In fact, many young Muslims were inspired and began to approach sport with confidence to take up not only the game of rugby, but were also encouraged to engage in other sports and physical activities where they were unrepresented. Some of whom are looking that they are too will enjoy the success I once did, if not exceed it. Such was my passion and zeal for sports, as becomes my life's mission to bring the enjoyment and benefits of sports to all. Going back even further, my parents arrived in this country 70 years ago, set up home in the inner cities of Leeds. My childhood is full, filled with fond memories of growing up in a very multicultural setting where everyone was considered part of our extended family. However, I did not realise the challenges of ethnicity until I got into the wider world beyond my neighbourhood. My father used to box in the Pakistani Air Force and was a very sporty individual. His enthusiasm rubbed onto us. My father, through sports, taught us the meaning and values of discipline, working hard and respect. Tragically, my father passed away suddenly at the age of 44 years, when I was only just 11 years old. However, the values and the, the values he instilled in me were strong and have been the ingredients of my success till this day, along with the prayers and blessings of my mother. We had to learn a hard lesson, lesson of responsibility very early to become the support my mother raised, needed to raise a family of six, single-handedly. There were times when we were risked, when we risked, when we risked going off to the rails. Could have done so had it not been for the people around us. I faced many challenges throughout my life, continue to do so. Previously, the focus was on my Asian heritage. Now we face a double challenge. The focus has been shifted in today's climate of not being only Asian, but Asian and a Muslim. During my career, my focus was mainly on for myself. Along the way. I was able to break down significant barriers to get to where I wanted. I enjoyed my success, but realised I couldn't be selfish. The way I had paid for myself, I had to keep open for others to come through. The obstacles are still there, and the changes are small and slow in coming. I do sincerely believe it is important to continue on the journey to ensure that aspiring talents are given the opportunities they truly deserve. Real change often takes generations. <coughs> In no doubt will. However, it's integral that together we utilise the value of vehicle or sports can be in sporting communities to establish peace, tolerance and harmony. Okay, that's a small part of, of, of a journey that uh, I still continue on quite a roller coaster. Um, a project I was involved in four or five years ago at Leeds Rugby, who currently were the world champions at that time, um, and managed the, the uh, largest project within the foundation. And it was uh, an opportunity for me to engage and, and come home to my home, hometown, because Leeds Rugby was the first time team I played for. And uh, can, we, can we show that now, please? Um, <coughs> it's, uh, It's a short video that, uh, that I put together at the club. Um, the, uh, the project was called Connected Communities Through Sport, and I had full autonomy uh, to do what I wanted at the club. And it was the first time the club had engaged with the wider communities. People don't know Leeds. Leeds is situated, the demographics of a large Asian population, a very successful club, uh, which really didn't, um, and still haven't, unfortunately, after the time I was there really gone out of their way and reach out to the wider communities. But here's an example of what, what can be done. There's some thought behind it.
is involved in trying to uh, educate uh, the lifestyles of young people using the power of sport, particularly but not exclusively, which is very typically, and other physical activity, particularly but not exclusively dance. Uh, we aim to educate and inform and generally bring young people to a better understanding of each other and the sort of social responsibilities they carry. Connecting communities buildings is right at the top of our agenda. At any one time, we have 30 programmes or more running together. None more important than connecting communities. The aim is to create better understanding, out of which comes respect, and out of understanding and respect come friendships between the communities that we serve. And serve is the word, the active word. Um, it's very, very important, I think, that young people get the chance to understand one another. There has to be some compromise. There has to be some give and take in a context where compromise is strength, not a weakness. in the semi-finals at Ellen Road and uh, unfortunately we got beat by uh, Leeds and they went on to Wembley nearest time we got to Wembley but 20 years that was uh, that game how time flies um, uh, that was a project that I got involved in it was a huge success it was funded by Sports England uh, it ran for three years we expect, uh, exceeded all expectations um, but unfortunately since I moved on uh, it's sort of come to a close there's some um, Exit routes, legacies in place. Um, uh, the black players. Um, I visited Jamaica twice. Um, I met with the Jamaican rugby league team, um, and we talk about uh, diversity. The uh, chair is a white Jamaican. His wife, an Indian Jewish girl. Um, wonderful people, and uh, we host them in Leeds twice. And uh, again, demographics of Leeds. There's a part in Chapter Hills, which is only uh, housed by. Um, Black and African beans, and uh, we reaching out to the communities, got them involved, and we did some amazing things. And it's uh, unfortunate that clubs like Leeds, my hometown, uh, are not really doing um, more than what they should be doing. Um, just going to move on to um, the British Asian Rugby Association um, that we set up, and. Uh, 
Um, okay. It's coming. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to whiz through this. Um, <coughs> we set up the AIDS Association about 10 years ago. In fact, we were celebrating our 10 year anniversary only a couple of months ago. Uh, and the uh, vicious Asian is a statement, the Asian terminology is a statement of. of uh, fact that Asians are just as passionate and enthusiastic about sport than anybody else. The organisation is an inclusive organisation and whenever we put a team out we make sure it's a good mix of the individuals that work and play and live in this country which our national team should follow suit. Uh, and the aim was to provide uh, some strong positive role models. And at the time they were telling me that not many Asians play. Uh, by putting the associates together we were able to bring a lot of Role models, people who are playing for quite some time, and uh, there's no bigger role model <laughs> than this gentleman here. Uh, we were delighted that uh, Paul was our keynote speaker at the reception we had at Parliament celebrating 10 years of rugby development. Um, role models, uh, again, you know, they were saying there wasn't any. Uh, by putting the association together, we could highlight a number of people who have been playing, and there were lots of people who've been playing before my time who weren't given the recognition and gone out of the game. By putting associations together, we could bring people who were playing before, new people who wanted to come in, and create an environment uh, which was safe and friendly. I remember way back um, when I previously worked as a sports event officer in Bradford, uh, it was a dual role with the local authority with the sport clubs. And uh, at the time, there was uh, an Asian cricket league and I questioned that, saying, why do you have an Asian cricket league? We need to move forward from that. And I was a bit naive at that time because they were saying, look, we just want to come and play cricket. We don't want any, any trouble, any issues on a weekend, race, discrimination, prejudice. We just want to have fun. So, you know, I can understand that. Uh, and at the time, maybe that was needed. Uh, and on many occasions I've been told to set up uh, Asian teams. Um, but uh, it's something that I'm not keen on and want to keep away. Hence the association is inclusive and we will put uh, players out which is a good mix. There are times we will heavily put Asian players in uh, to make a statement but generally speaking we'll put a team a good mix. Just to highlight uh, a few players on the uh, on my right, probably your left, uh, Chajiv Singh Masson was playing for the Premiership for Harlequins five years on the trot. Uh, Harlequins are one of the most successful teams um, in Europe. Um, and he wasn't recognised by the governing body. A great shame. Uh, on uh, my left, your right, we've got a young girl uh, from uh, Malaysia. Uh, just demonstrates that uh, uh, clothing, religion, is, is no barrier to participate in sports. Uh, just below in the middle, um, Sam Hussain, representing Yorkshire. Uh, uh, on the left side, Halima Khan, level two, a rugby league coach. Administrator working for the Rugby Football League for three years. She was successful. Um, we taught India. Uh, the, the Calcutta Cup, as we know it, uh, the traditions is from India. It's, it's rupees melted down to make the cup uh, and they brought it over to these shores. And that's the oldest tournament in the world. Uh, so when they say Asians don't play rugby, uh, they've been playing rugby uh, in India uh, since the 16th century. Um, our journey, um, we had a team of Bala Celeb teams, Bala Celebs, people like Martin and Fire, uh, for example, a well known personality in rugby uh, media uh, representatives, and it provides a platform uh, to get a strong statement out to the politicians. There was that time when, when Gordon Brown was, was in power, um, and after that game, immediately after that game, it was, in fact, it was Terry Sutcliffe, the sports minister then, his first appointment uh, in attending our game and on the Wednesday following at question time, uh, Barr was applauded of the work that he had done. Um, here again, um, got the yellow card. Um, uh, one of our successes, uh, we are a team, all my players play for different clubs, associations and we get together every time. The only time we get together is to raise awareness and promote, promote the game with, with role models. Um, on so many occasions I've supported the Help for Heroes. What I want the uh, politicians to do uh, is to support uh, campaigns like uh, the Pakistan 
League Fund. And this is uh, a political rugby league team. Something very similar, uh, but it's the rugby union team, the political rugby union team made up of MPs uh, and Lords. Uh, here, celebrating 10 years last year, we played against Spain, their first ever game. So Farah continuing in developing the game uh, across Europe. Something that we're involved in, the White Ribbon Campaign, a global initiative for life of its kind, made up of men speaking out against violence towards women and girls, something that we adopt and speak out uh, at every opportunity occasion. Uh, Histic, so we took a parliamentary team uh, to India last August to engage. We're still a long way. One of the MPs whose demographics is a lot of Asians uh, made a statement saying that he watched Gandhi just before we went out to get a better understanding of the Asian culture. Uh, last but not least, um, uh, I put an autobiography together uh, a couple of years ago. I'm also not for my um, uh, profession as a, a rugby player, but more so the work that we do campaigning and reaching out to the communities. Uh, and we're in the process of doing the second stage of the book. Um, on that note, thank you for listening to me. Thank you everyone. Um, I'm sure you'll all, all agree, very unique experiences I think each of each one of them has had um, and really interesting to hear those experiences. We are going to, as I said earlier on, um, open up to the floor now for any questions. Before, I'm going to take the, the advantage of being the chair and ask the first question. Um, so you've all spoken about um, you know, your own experiences and I think every one of you has given examples of practically where the community that you're from or, or the, the background that you're from, where you are, the, the practical initiatives that the community themselves are taking. Because one of the um, criticisms that we often hear in the sports industry is we as a community aren't doing enough to engage with sport and we're not interested. Which I think, just hearing from you guys, it, it's, it's not, not really true. So Paul, you spoke about um, some, some of the work in terms of the, the number of black coaches, for example, that are qualified but yet aren't getting the jobs. Sani, you spoke about your own experiences as, as a Bengali woman um, and, and the number of women you train that, that want to engage. You've just spoken about the number of initiatives that, you know, it's countless initiatives that are going through. So I'd like to hear from all of you really around what is it practically that now needs to be done, not by the community, but, but everyone else out there to, to try and move, you know, move towards a more level playing field. So whoever wants to take that. Shall I? Go ahead, um, Well, I think... <coughs> From, from my world, um, there are uh, it's about there are so many young people out there that want to get jobs, want to be involved in football. I'm talking about at the elite level, and one of the biggest challenges they they find is obviously the transparency in the recruitment processes, the accountability, because football historically has been job for the boys. So whoever comes in brings all his friends in, all his mates in. When he goes they go, and so on and so forth. And that's been repetitive and been consistent for, for many a year gone by. And I, and I just feel now it's, you know, I, I'm not a believer in quotas, if I'm honest with you, but I'm a believer in positive, affirmative action. I'm a believer in transparency and accountability of the recruitment processes, and obviously advertising. And, obviously, and that's where diversity becomes so relevant. The composition of the boards, has to reflect the community and the people that they serve, and they don't. And I, and I, I believe that that's the single biggest area that we need a total transparency from start to finish, because all you know, my colleagues and I myself ever wanted was if I wanted to go and apply for a job. Number one, do I have the requisite qualifications? Yes. Number two, can I go in front of somebody and articulate myself and sell myself, which is effectively what you have to do. Yes. Number three, you know, um, the process. There's going to be total transparency of that process. So you can say, okay, then, I'm accepting. But that hasn't been. And I, I think that's one thing that I would really, really want is to know then when I'm going for a job, I know I've got the same opportunity as everybody else. Because all I ever wanted was that equality of opportunity. Because I'm a very motivated guy. I'm a very driven guy in everything that I do. And that's what I would like to see. Um, that's the next phase for me of that kind of implementation because that gives people confidence that gives people belief in processes and that's got to come right the way throughout the whole of football and it's got to start with the governing bodies that leadership is intrinsic uh, and I think if they show that lead 
Because they're not going you know, to remember, they're, they're not totally responsible. They can't sh demonstrate to the club what they should be doing. But there, there has to be, for me, their leadership is very, very important. And their leadership in these processes. So that's what I would like to see. And I'm hopeful that in the passage of time, there's a lot of good going on. I mean, I don't want to be down, uh, sound negative, but there's so much more to be done. That's the point. And, and I just feel we can't rest on our laurels about what was done. It's about the challenges today, the 21st century challenges, and how is football going to implement and work together in a very collective, collaborative way to ensure sustainable, measurable change. Uh, to, well, to add to that, um, I'm not sure that we're, where we're doing that already. We've got individuals, uh, I've highlighted uh, one or two uh, on the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, Halima Khan qualified uh, in level two in not just rugby, but cricket. There's cricket posts going on, there's rugby posts going on. She's applying for them. Um, sometimes being shortlisted, sometimes she's not. She, she fully qualifies for the criteria, the essentials, and she's not being given the uh, appointments. So how do we break that down? There, there needs to be a system in place. You mentioned about transparency. When we ask, uh, they sort of close the door on us. Um, Myself, um, I used to work for local authority, I used to work for the governing body, I worked for two world champion rugby clubs, um, and still uh, very much disillusioned about them uh, doing the right thing and engaging with the wider communities. So, consequently, I've set up Barra and Sporting Change, and uh, bringing these people on board to demonstrate that uh, we've got good individuals, male and female, who can um, work it at the top with the best. Um, but it's getting through that barrier and it's still not happening as much. And then when individuals do get in, um, you know, we like to think they'd open the door and provide up more opportunities. But my experience is they, they're closing the door ajar and we're, we're not being helped to get through the system. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, do I need this? Mm -hmm. um, I think I come from a woman's perspective, um, having two male panel panelists. Uh, one of the things that I feel quite strongly is the fact that women are not fairly represented in sports. It's not just my sports, just sports in general. Um, although women's football has come a long way and they are receiving more exposure, but generally women in sports are not getting the exposure that they deserve and um, they're not highlighted as role models, which is something that we really need to focus and bring to the forefront because we work just as hard um, and we, you know, we are role models and we break down barriers and, um, you know, inspire the next generation. And this should not be the case. In this generation, we should not still have these obstacles in place. Um, one of the things that I personally have been working on is the sports hijab um, to help Muslim women access sport. Being a Muslim female myself, I understand the fact that going into training and um, having a hijab or could be you know, quite intimidating and the way you look and the way you dress it should not be, again, another barrier. So I've actually been working on a project where um, we're creating a sports hijab that is breathable, that is sport friendly, that allows you to just get on with training without having uh, the prejudice, without you know, um, giving yourself confidence, being able to participate in sport and not be judged. Um, and this was inspired by the Olympics for myself, where the elite athletes were actually catered for where uh, the Muslim female who was actually taking part in judo was allowed to wear the sports hijab and that was designed by Nike. And I thought to myself, if it's available for the elite athletes, why is it not there for regular people? Again, this is something that we need to address and um, practice where Muslim women can, can take part in sports. I recently read um, that only 11% of Muslim females are in sports and participating, which is a number that is too low. Um, and that is something that, you know, having a sports hijab could make the difference. And also having the facilities and the support and um, the right exposure for women in sports in general. <coughs> Any questions from the floor?
Jewish. It's been really inspiring. Everybody's story has been absolutely fantastic. I have to say, what Sam's my favourite. For these reasons. No bias. Put it out there. Um, but I'm interested in the whole kind of activism and power that that athletes have to make a real political statement. And I think. In this country, we're actually quite limited in terms of how far along the line we are with that in terms of uh, when we think globally as well. And I'm just interested to get the perspectives from the panellists really about what they think athletes could do or should do and then the reality of what happens when they do make a start. So, you know, if I refer to... Um, the fantastic Jessica Ennis-Hill and what happened last year with the, the case of Chad Evans and she yeah. came out and she, she kind of really made a statement to, to that particular football club and said, you know, if you want to do this, you need to take, if you want to take this man on, you're going to have to take my name off of the stadium. Um, and that was a really powerful moment, but as a consequence, she received her own rape threats and all sorts that happened to her as a consequence of that kind of um, political activism, sports activism. So I'm really interested to see what, what you guys think of that and, and the consequences for athletes as well. Anyone on the panel? Um, well, well, I think they play an important part. Whether the individuals want to play that part is, is down to the individuals. Um, uh, you know, um, we know about Jessica because we were involved in that and we fully supported her and she got our full support. Um, uh, I get an example of, of uh, myself when I was playing. Um, clubs had alcohol sponsorships on the jerseys, uh, and as a Muslim, do we go with that? You know, um, unfortunately at the time I wasn't strong enough uh, in my faith, or uh, wasn't too keen to speak out. Um, and then you got Hash and Hamler, the, the world South African cricket star, who uh, they make his own top as an individual so he doesn't have to wear stuff like that so it can be done it's how strong we are as individuals and whether we prepared to face consequences of being outcasted um, and I know myself sometimes I speak out a little bit too often uh, and uh, doors are closed uh, towards me but we've been speaking out that much now I'm thinking, I think I owe it to myself and I think we all have a duty and responsibility because the actions don't affect us as individuals affects the wider community and, and we've got to think about why are we involved? Are we doing it for ourselves or are we doing it far more um, that it has an impact on other people? So I, I like to think that people should speak out. You know we used to say sport and politics don't mix, but it does. Uh, sporting celebrities, sporting stars uh, can play a large part in what goes on on the political arena. Yeah, I mean I agree with Ikram. I mean, I think in, in my world of football, the, I mean, I made a point when I was speaking about human rights and working in a, in a racist free environment. And, and the basis of when I lobby is because of that right. Because, you know, I see it as a field of play. The football pitch is like your office, it's your work. And the circumference of the stadium are people that pay money and go. So there has to be a code of conduct that they have to behave in accordance with law and good practice. And if they're found to be in breach of that, they have to be excluded from the stadium. It's as simple as that. So I think in football, I mean, we know the power of football, and I think there's a lot of good people doing a lot of work. I mean, I, but I think there has to be more uh, because I think there has to be. We know the potency of potency of football, the profiling of football, the way you know the positive stuff can happen, and when something negative, the negative side of it as well. Um, but I, I would just like to to see a more. It's funny if I talked to Michelle before this, and the, I think there has to be more of a strategic, joined up thinking collectively, because there's a lot of people doing individual stuff, but when you have a movement of people working in a very clear constructive, cohesive, collective way, the message is more potent and you influence more. And I'd like to see that more because there are individuals doing work, but I just don't think it impacts as much as the collective doing it together and have a shared set of objectives about the messaging 
that you want to get out there. Because when I look at real change that's ever really happened with him, it's been when there's been a collective. That's when changes happen. Because, I mean, I, I remember, I think it was about a year and a half, I remember Yaya Torre coming out and speaking. I mean, he got horrific abuse. I think he's playing for Man City. Not in Europe, wasn't it? Yeah. Eastern Europe, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and Patrick Vieira, when he was at Man City, they were in a tournament in Serbia, I think it was, and he removed the players from the pitch. I'm not saying I'm necessarily an advocate of that, because it can give out mixed signals. But that was right at the time. But look at the impact that it had. Because at the end of the day, no one is above law, no one is above regulation. And I just feel that that needs to be, from my own set of lenses as, a, as an ex-player and somebody that's been campaigning a fair while, I'd like to see that more of a, a joined up thinking with a lot of, because there's a lot of stuff going on out there. But just a collective will, because I just think then the message is far more stronger. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful in, in, in a period of time that that's the kind of change that... Um, that I'd like to see. Roxana? Um, I strongly do agree with the fact that sports people do have a platform where they can voice their opinion. And um, it's just going back to on a human level, doing the right thing. Um, it's not whether you're sports, it's just having that um, as a person, what would I do? And speaking out and um, for me, that's what I would do, is just <coughs> being a human and doing the right thing and doing the decent thing for everyone. Can I make a further point? Because, I mean, I think, you know, from a personal <laughs> perspective, I think one of the worst experiences in my life was being abused, was somebody throwing bananas at me, you know, being called a, a black this and a black... And I just feel you take it, it's such a personal feeling that you feel, no, this can't happen. Nobody on, in my office, in my work, has a right to come and say that to me. If you want to think it, think it, but don't tell me it. But then why do they think that? So there's a whole big kind of educational mind shift that needs to be changed here. And I just think football is, is such a, an amazing vehicle to engage, unite, to break down barriers. And, and make no mistake, you know, there is so much work, good work going on, work going on in football clubs. I mean, I think, I think there's a kind of misconception, you know, you're going to be the new big TV deal with Sky's coming an extra, you know, 70% on the club's worth about £5 billion. The reality is the majority of that money goes to the clubs and 80% of that money is going to go in transfer fees and salaries. So actually it's not reaching the grassroots and all the clubs have individual trusts that are not necessarily, they're not financed by the club. They're completely separate entities and they have to, because I sit on a number of trusts, so I understand how the process works. So they have to be structured in accordance with the Charities Commission. So they have to go out and fundraise and have partnerships. So, you know, but, but I think that, uh, you know, notwithstanding that, it, it, it's, not so much, it is about doing the right thing. And mine come back to my roots, my upbringing, seeing how my parents was, had, had suffered and the challenge that they had, and my own experiences, and trying to kind of correct a kind of social injustice that I see that's, that's been prevalent. For, 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 for many years. And, and if I look at the modern day players, many of them don't understand what my generation have gone through because they've just come into the game, had a very kind of easy passage <coughs> and gone straight, and, and don't actually understand the issues. That's why it's important that we have to talk about the past and we have to talk about the issues and the challenges, but talk about the journey, talk about the problems, but also then focus on what I call now are the 21st century problems because the issues now is just not just about race anymore. Race is important, but obviously as you know, gender inclusion, you know, homophobia, you know, there's, there's you know, there's so many other different disability, you know, there's so many other issues now which form part of what I call the 21st century discrimination. So it's a kind of zero tolerance right the way across the board. But also, I think the whole education process has got to be very important. From the home, joined up with the school, with the sports club, with the club. There, there has to be a more, there has to be a, a greater alignment, a greater uh, 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 responsibility, collective responsibility. Because one thing I, I do really oppose, when people talk about football, like football's responsible to solve all society's ills, it's not. Football's got a great part to play, and it's played its role, and can still do more. But there is so much good that's going on. But there's other agencies out there that have to be responsible as well. 
And, and that's why you find anything that happens in football, it's totally and utterly magnified at times out of all proportion. Because the reality of it, it's not like that. So I'd like to see, you know, greater, a, a, a kind of more collaborative way of working. You know, because, you know, the word CSR, corporate social responsibility, so much, we are one of the leading countries in the world in this area, you know, with what, what, what the clubs do. So I just find that football is not responsible for everything. And players, okay, being a role model isn't something that I set out to do. It was just something that's come, become inherent in your journey. Because you feel, well, if you've got the capability to articulate, give back, and, 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 and then why shouldn't you do it? And many footballers out there, so many of them do that. And you know, and I know the commercial value is on the one that doesn't do it, behaves offside, goes behaves inappropriately, and that's totally magnified and blown out of horrific proportion. So I think we have to kind of keep a, a context to it. But I really want um, the next the challenges, there's some huge challenges ahead in this country. And um, I think football and sport, I think, is really the catalyst. Uh, to the potential solutions, but it can't be alone and be seen to take full responsibility. Yeah. Um, question for, for Paul. Um, so in the in the eighties, like when you, when you and in the nineties, when you were playing uh, like yourself, mm. people like John Barnes, mm. they kind of hit a tipping point yeah. where the black players became acceptable. They were big stars of the game, and now you don't think twice when there's a black player on a team. It's completely normal. Yeah. Do you think? there has to be a high profile black manager to hit that tipping point now or do you think there's more of an endemic problem yeah, at I the mean, kind of management level well i mean listen there's massive i mean you've only got i mean i was overwhelmed i mean he's a dear friend of mine uh, chris ramsey yeah because there's so many we've lost a generation of black coaches or ex black players that wanted to become coaches and get involved with management because they couldn't get in the entry point wasn't there and i feel that to see somebody now, I mean, it's, it's horrific to think it's so disproportionate where black players now are what I call fixture on fitting of the modern day game. Close to 30% in the game are playing every week and they're accepted as the norm. Yet we've got six black managers, coaches. It's so disproportionate and that underrepresentation <coughs> is, 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 is for me is a huge challenge and because and, and seeing somebody like Chris Ramsey that given so much the community the lift it's given so many people in sport but he needed the chance I mean you look at Chris Ramsey's CV he's got as good a CV as anybody in the game so he's so he and he told me about all the challenges that he's had and I'm, I'm so delighted he had a leap of faith and obviously a relationship with 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 Les Ferdinand and, and, and but those relationships have always existed within the game. So I'm, so I really, me personally, I'm so desperate for QPR to stay up because I think that it will send out such a strong, positive message. But even if they don't, you know, at least he's been given an opportunity to demonstrate that he can go, you know, and be a part of the, the higher echelon within the game. Because you look at him, he's a very articulate man, a very intelligent man, very well respected by the players. You know, so he's, a, you know, impeccable CV, lots of experience, but he was somebody who had a leaf of faith, gave him a chance. And I think, he, you know, Chris is an excellent role model and he's got the, what I call the natural consciousness about this issue and really using himself from, and promoting himself to society and community. But do you think, so if he's successful, you think, do you think that'll be a trigger for perceptions to change? Or do you think oh. there's more, there's a mindset change that still needs to happen where... Mindsets need to be changed. Yes, there's no doubt. Kind of, Whether he's successful yeah. or not, we all want to be successful, of course we do, but we still need to change attitudes. Attitudes need to be changed. And, and I think what's very important, that what, what the PFA are doing, they're building like a, you've got to build a pipeline. But you know, if I was, wanted to become a manager, which I don't, you know, it, the best thing I could see is somebody there at the top of the tree, that A's been given an opportunity, B's been very successful at it. That's what empowers and motivates me to say, hey, I can do that because that, you know, he's up there in the stars. So I still think attitudes need to change, but I think it's a good start. You know, somebody like Chris, uh, uh, Ramsey, Chrissy Powell, Chris U and the three Chrises, and then you've got, uh, who's doing a fabulous job, um, over at Burton Albion, Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. You know, these are, but again, there should be more. There has to be more. And, and that, for me, is one of the real big challenges. But it's just great. I always say, 
you can't have inclusion. Talk about this word inclusion. How do you measure inclusion? How do you evaluate it? How do you monitor it? You can't have inclusion until you have visibility. And the visibility is not there. It's not there within the structures. It's not there within the ministry. We need more. So when I see that, and you know, in myself and Rimless, you know, how, how do we measure the success of our work? We measure it by visibility, by change. You have to start with the psychology, the education of change mindset of those with power, and then it's about implementation of those actions thereafter in visibility, in visual terms. That's when you real, that's how I measure inclusion. So I always say to people when I'm speaking, and you know, I, I might upset some people sometimes by things I say. I do not deliberately, but I try to tell it how it is. You know, you may agree or you may disagree with me, but one thing no one's ever done, and with the people I'm talking about, the audience, I said they've not walked in my shoes. So that's my strongest, most potent weapon. So all I'm just using my experiences, my knowledge, and at times intelligent to make to, to make change. And I know from making change, it's about working with people. It's about trust, building trust, building collaborative relationships. Because if you're all out there, if all of you audience all doing business, you're going to be more <coughs> successful doing business with people that you trust and you get on with and you understand and you know. That's how you build trust, and that's how you make change. Okay. We've got time for... Okay, quick questions? I'll go for all three. Okay. Okay, mine's from a more sort of health point of view. I work as a dietitian in East London, so I see the parents with all the health conditions, and we see the, the younger generation with the diabetes and the obesity. So for those who've worked on community projects, what are the barriers you've come across in terms of the parents? Okay, we'll just take the questions first and then anything else. So, what was your um, I want to ask, uh, Roxana, you said that you had to overcome a lot in terms of, well, firstly, concealing your participation from your parents and then having to win them over. Do you think there needs to be more outreach and engagement with parents to encourage their children to participate in this program? Okay, Barry, uh, sorry, Billy. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a question directed to uh, both Paul and Paul. It's, um, Institutionalised racism. Okay, um, you quoted uh, Rooney's rule. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you know? I'm with you with this change uh, coming up the pipelines and everything. But don't you think, in order to break those chains, sometimes it's got to be something quite radical? I, you know, where there's a ruling where the candidates perhaps are from properly represented. You quoted the figure of 30 percent plus of, uh, of players. You know, shouldn't the selection panel be? part of that photo as well, the people selecting. And that, that, that sort of, uh, that, that change will almost forcibly bring about a change because this, this may take decades, it may take decades and decades for it to be changed. We've got something institutionalised and, and repeated over and over again. To break the system down, uh, I, I'm sure you've been, well, you both gave examples, all three gave examples of, 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 you know, of encountering it. Um, I'm just asking you clearly, you know, you said you were against the women's rules, so... I'm against it, no, I'm pro it. Are you pro? Against yes, quotas. I'm against quotas. Yeah. You're against quotas, okay. Yes. So you so, to okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give the distinction in the, in the answer. Okay, okay, so we've got yeah. three questions, one regarding from the health perspective and engaging in that sense. We've got parents' involvement and the... the well, I guess it's related to quotas and yeah, it is, kind it? of um, a dynamic kind of an intervention. I'd just like to yeah. ask, uh, you know, ask uh, whether they... they uh, they would go, that they think they first and foremost is there, you know, institutionalised racism, is it there, okay. it's an endemic. Okay. And the second question is, would you bring in a ruling like that to combat this? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, firstly, I am 100% pro ruling law. I don't believe in quotas, but what I do believe in is what I call positive affirmative action. That's what I believe in. And, I, and the ruling law in essence is, if there's a, 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 a black candidate, black and minority ethnic candidate, with the requisite qualifications, he has a right or she has a right to be interviewed. That's absolutely fair. Because at the end of the day, this is the two key things about the rule and rule is, number one, there's no guarantee of a job. But what it's doing, if it was me going for a job, there's no guarantee, but it's giving me the interview experience in front of a senior executive. And they may look at my CV and say, well, you know what, Paul, for whatever reason, you may not be the suitable candidate. However, what that does, it stimulates debate at the higher level. And that's been one of the key issues. Because there's been no transparency or accountancy, uh, accountability in processes, you don't get to the interview. So if you don't get to the interview, how can I impose myself 
if so you're 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 the chairman of the football club. You might say, you know what, Paul, you know, you might not be the right guy, but then you're talking to the chairman of Tottenham or Arsenal, and you might and they might say, Oh yeah, I'm looking for someone like him. Oh yeah, okay, well here's his C V. And that for me is such a key component to stimulate that debate at the higher echelons, uh, which ordinarily doesn't happen. And number two, as I said, there's no guarantee of a job. And number three, I think it's important to create what I call a, a ready list. So this is part of the proposals where the, the PFA have got a, a, a ready list of all the uh, prospective candidates with the right qualifications for the job. And diversity is very important within that. So I think that they're the three kind of areas that I think are, uh, and I want to come away from the Rooney Rule because the name don't do it for me. We just got to have just an English tailored version of that to our needs in this country. So I'm up for massive radical change because it, it does need to happen. On the lady's point about the, um, the obesity, I mean, I think it's quite simple because it's all about education. And that's got to come from the home starting, <laughs> joined up with the school, joined up with the rec recreational, you know, there's, there's got to, that's about relationships, isn't it? Uh, but at the moment, it's all very fractured, isn't it? That's the problem, isn't it? But in terms of parents' involvement and... It's, it's going to be a collective. It's going to be a collective. interested in sport, for Absolutely. example, they're more likely to be. Yeah. Um, in terms of your question, actually, I work for a charity called Osmani Trust, oh. and they actually support parents, especially from the community, and they provide services like the health trainers, mm. rather than going to the GP who's just going to give you a prescription and tell you to take antidepressants or something. Mm. Um, they actually have one-to-one -one sessions where they help them uh, with exercise, with lifestyle changes, with educating them. And I think that is what we need more of. Um, and education is a key part of shifting the mindset. Um, and I guess it's um, integrating with society as well, bringing them out of their homes and allowing them to have women's only sessions, things that they feel comfortable with, slowly breaking down those barriers. Um, I know uh, Whitechapel Sports Centre, for example, has women's only sessions on a Monday night and it's so busy and um, more centres need to have these kind of um, execute these kind of um, sessions to allow women to come in where they feel safe, where they can, you know, kind of build their confidence and don't feel intimidated and eventually, um, you know, stand on their own two feet and turn in, turn up to a normal session. Um, but that initial change, they need to have um, a slow, steady progress rather than them just walking into a, a spring, Oh, I can't even say now, a circuit class or a session that they might feel that is out of their depth. Um, so again, the education, the, the boroughs need to do a lot more, providing health trainers, support, role models um, for them to engage and feel safe in an environment. Yes, please. Um, yes, I agree both with Paul and Roxana. Um, I thought they both said really well. I do believe that we need more people which reflective uh, of the communities that we serve, um, government bodies, local authorities, institutions, should go out of the way uh, to bring people on board. Um, there is an issue of are they qualified, but we know that a lot of people who are qualified, are just as qualified and more so the people who are already there. So I, I, I do believe that they have responsibility duty to go out and bring them on board. Uh, and then the ones who are not, uh, bring them on board. We, we know about mentoring programs, buddy systems, etc. Let's get them involved. Let's bring them up to this level. Uh, and that's not happening as much as we would like. But clearly there is a lot of suicide racism. Community development, we do a lot of that. And only now we're hearing things from governing bodies, the political uh, individuals saying that we should use sport for more of a social change. And we've been doing that for years. Uh, uh, again, back in our areas of West Yorkshire, we work with an organisation called Hamara, the Living Centre, one of the key service providers to the Asian communities, uh, not just Leeds, but across the country now. And we've got all, all, you know, elderly groups, women groups, disability groups within that centre. Um, it's about providing that sense of belonging. And I'm telling the sports bodies that they need to think of uh, an indirect way when they're engaging with the wider communities, not to go and expect them to play rugby, football, or any other sports, indirectly work with them. Give them that sense of belonging. Make them feel very part of it and reach out to them and slowly you'll get them involved. And we want people from the wider communities involved in our sport across all sections at all levels. And in time, 
people who come through the system where it's plain, participating, rights officials, just come to watch the game, etc. That will happen. But at the moment, there's no engagement, or not enough engagement, they're not reaching out, and they're not making them feel comfortable. Uh, we've got clubs uh, situated in the heart of the wider communities, and they wonder why people are not coming through the turtles or coming to watch them. Because they are not reaching out, they are not making them feel part of the club. And the club should be a hub of a society, and that's not happening. Okay, we haven't got much long um, left. Um, I just wanted to sort of close the discussion with a final question to, to all three of you um, to really kind of hit, hit the main point for you. So if you were, you know, in a, hopefully in a month's time we'll have a new government. Um, and if, you were, <laughs> if you were the new sports minister, and I was asked this question recently but in, in a different context, but if you were the, the new sports minister for whatever government we end up having, um, what would be, you know, the, the one thing that you would do to really address this issue of diversity, so really embrace diversity in sport as, as this whole session is about? So whoever wants to take that first. Should I go, Paul? Go on, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got two. Uh, accountability to, to mm -hmm. all the organisations and directing of funding. Uh, initially, at the moment, you've got uh, the, the funding from Sport England given to the, the clubs, uh, the governing bodies, uh, and in turn, that's not getting uh, diluted to the, the community clubs. So I would redirect the funding to the grassroots clubs who are actually doing the work uh, and have been in for, for many, many years. Volunteers, you have to take your hat off them because many are doing it not for anything apart from love and passion of the, of the game. Thank you. That's two. I'll do. <laughs> I don't think I can give two, I don't think I can give one, I might have to give four. <laughs> but I made a point what I wanted within the FA and the, the objective and the aspiration that equality, diversity and inclusion is within the DNA of the FA staff, council members, boards, committees. So it's just fixture and fitting of, of, of the modern 21st century within the FA. That's what I want and trying to work with good people like Rimmel and others to achieve. Um, just talk about transparency, accountability of recruitment processes, absolutely intrinsic. Government funding, there should be caveats assigned to that to ensure that a percentage of the, 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 the composition of the boards are diverse and far greater, should have greater inclusion on the boards. And I think more money, I made the point before about the massive new TV deal, and about the money that goes into the top line. I'd like to see some kind of, uh, I know there's been an announcement that 50 million pounds is going per club, that's a Premier League club, but I still feel there should be a greater, better distribution within the pyramid structure into football clubs, actual trusts. I sit on a very successful trust, Charlton Athletic, and they do some fabulous work using the power of football. And that is for fun of the, the, the point that, 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 that Roxanne made about and, I, and the work they do, particularly with women, is amazing. They've got, you know, who are smoking, got depression, you know, just uh, programs, using the football club as the heartbeat and the hub of the community, because that's what it stands for. To, and, and using the power of football and sport to address so many issues. So I, I can't give one or two, I've had to give a combination of four. I know, there's too much to do, but um, a wise man told me uh, out of uh, the acorn has come the tree. But, um, but we've got some great work to do. I, but I do genuinely believe there's such a will to change, though. I don't want to be too negative about it. I know the challenges, and I don't want anybody to come out of this room being blinded about the challenges, but sometimes to be reflective of the journey of where we are, what we've done, but also mindful about where we need to go and how strategically we're going to get there. Uh, my final point would be the fact that um, women should get the recognition and equal opportunity um, as men do in sport. So that kind of support and framework needs to exist where women are recognised as sports women and that they are given that support. Um, also funding into sports and lastly, one more, sorry. Um, sports, um, not just football, sports such as my sport which is um, a major sport in the world but not highly recognized in London or in, in England 
um, by way, if you go to Thailand, if you go to Russia, you go to Ukraine, it's one of the popular sports. In fact, you have the Kazakhstan uh, president who actually funds their uh, Muay Thai team. So it's unfair on sports that are uh, not a big sport in in, in UK and um, funding needs to be distributed more evenly to get stars in other sports rather than all the mainstream sports. Um, and so they're, they're my two points, firstly women in sports and other sports who are working just as hard, who are doing it without funding, just simply because of passion and trying to make a difference in, in and inspiring others and getting up there. Thank you. Okay. So I think it's time to close now. So just a few thank yous, first of all, to our panellists. So if we could just show them to you. <laughs> to, to you guys for coming out. Obviously, it's, it is Good Friday. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Some people have, were, were planning to go elsewhere and then they've come here. So I really appreciate every one of you turning up um, and coming here and, and engaging with, with the panellists. Um, to, to Ramiz, to City Circle, the organisers, thank you very much. Find out more about City Circle Remus is your your go-to guy. Um, this was obviously organised by m myself with with Remus and the City Circle uh, through my consultancy, Rim Gym Consulting, which is in inclusion and diversity in sports. So if you want to know more about that, let me know um, and, and come to speak to me. But like I said, you've got an opportunity to speak to the panelists now for a little while as well before we get kicked out. So please do uh, take advantage of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.